Startup Unscripted. The questions you have with the truths you need to hear. And now your host, Michael Dencio. Uh, what's up, guys? Uh, nice to see you. Welcome back to the show. This is Startup Unscripted. As you guys know, this is Michael Dincio, founder of Next Level Consultants. And uh, man, when I listen to that intro, that 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 music just gets me going still after four years. So uh, I think I think I chose the right the right song. Um, today we have some special guests on the program, and I'm excited to interview you guys because you uh, you've been in the business forever. Your name is uh, uh, carries a lot of weight, and for that reason, you're on the program. And so uh, I'm going to introduce you guys. Uh, I got David Cohen and Liam. Uh oh, Liam Cur Cra Cray. Cray. That's a lot easier than what that looks like. Uh, <laughs> Li Liam Cray. So these guys are with Cohen Property Law Group. Uh, David owns and and founded the the group, and Liam basically manages and runs the whole show as the managing director. And you know, I, we're just going to get into some leases today. So it's all about startups and leases and pitfalls folks if you're just joining us uh and, and you, you didn't know about this podcast like we have been working on all of this content for the last three years about how to do a startup and i think in 2020 we started at the top and we worked our way all the way through interviewing great people and now um and now uh, uh you know we we're starting back at the top and working our way through so so essentially, we've gone through on kind of like in the second edition, the second season, we've gone through vision, we've gone through demographics and real estate, and now we're getting into the lease, and that's why these guys are on. So David and Liam, welcome to the show, guys. Tell me a little bit about your firm, just like quick and dirty, and 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 then we'll get into some cool questions. Yeah, thanks so much for having us. Uh, we feel privileged and honored to be part of this. You know, we've seen it quite often flowing through on the uh, on, on the LinkedIn and, and popping in as well. Um, so we definitely appreciate being being a part of this. And um, we're excited today. Um, as you mentioned, I'm David Cohen, and I'm the owner and founder of Cohen Property Law Group and also Cohen Law Firm, which many are familiar with, and it's our dental firm. And, you know, as far as startups are concerned, we do over 100 startups per year nationwide. And so we have a really great perspective on different startups and in particular the leasing side of it and that's why i'm so excited to have liam here um, as well with me who is the managing director of our real estate group um, and handles all the leases yeah, thanks, hey, thanks, Michael. hey how you doing uh thanks for having me i'm glad to be here with you guys and to discuss leasing that's awesome well so the the way i guys uh the audience the way i kind of set this up is this is just three dudes having a conversation in a coffee shop. And the joke was that Liam is literally sitting in a coffee shop. So he's guys, he's hot on the mute button right now. So he'll be in and out. We'll, we'll, we'll fire off our questions. He can jump and in. I but... just came from a coffee shop too. <laughs> yeah. And I'm drinking a super unhealthy Coca-Cola, but you would think that I have like a corporate sponsor, uh, but, I, but I don't. Um, <laughs> For those of you watching on YouTube, uh, which you should if you can't, uh, you can see us three jokers on there. And um, yeah, the, it, we we sometimes can be a, a little animated. So ch check us out on YouTube. But guys, let's get let's get into some stuff here. Let's get into some like nitty gritty. I think that's why people listen to the program, because there's no we just don't hold any bars back and we just get right into it. And uh, the lease is honestly, in my opinion, the, the most valuable document of a dental practice. Without a lease, you got nothing. Literally, you got nothing. Like without a location to operate your company, what do you got? You got a bunch of patients and a great clinical team, and a lot of really expensive equipment. But without the lease, uh, what do you do? Relocate and then the patients can't find you. So so let's go through like the first steps of the process and and you know, big picture, it starts with the LOI. And um, David, why don't you like set the tone for like how you and the real estate broker and Liam jump in too, but how you guys interact on those first stages, or maybe you don't and they pass it once it gets to it, but just kind of paint the picture big, big picture. What are you inheriting? What's important about the LOI? 
and then we'll get into some of the other mechanics of, of the lease later. Sure. So whenever we approach a, a lease scenario, there's really three goals. We want to help the client save time, save money and save headaches. And the best way to do that is to involve um, a, an attorney at the beginning stages when the LOI is commencing, because actually I would say the majority of the time that we get involved, the client has already signed the LOI and we haven't had an opportunity to look at it. Uh, and so I think step one is just is making sure that get you involved, <laughs> get you yeah. involved. Yeah. yeah. Whatever, whatever intent gets gets signed uh, or I'm sorry, gets gets reviewed. Yeah. Um, now, there are great um, advisors out there like yourself, Mike. And so, you know, as long as you have somebody looking at it, I mean, we, you know, we're biased, but we would like to look at it as well. But you need to have somebody uh, that's on your team. Team is critical mm -hmm. when you embark on a startup. You got to have someone on your team review it and you got to have your team set up at the LOI stage. And I think that's really helpful. Um, in addition, I will say that the LOIs that we're seeing are not always that thorough. And, um, and again, when you're trying to save time, money and headaches, you really want to get out in front of things from the beginning stage of the LOI. And there's sort of a, a delicate balance. You don't want the LOI to be so detailed that, you know, you have deal fatigue before you even get in the deal. The parties don't like each other. Landlord doesn't like the tenant. Tenant doesn't like the landlord. You don't want that. You don't want to get way deep, but you also need to get into it a little bit enough to the extent that, you know, you know what you're, you're getting into when you get into the lease, because the LOI is the foundation and it sets the tone for the deal. So, yeah. you know, to summarize, I would say it's really important to get the LOI reviewed and it's important to make sure that it has at least the key components um, that are foundational in a lease. Um, when you when you enter into the transaction. And what we find is that in the startup, most of the time, the landlords are corporate um, sort of institutional landlords, and, and they have tougher leases and tougher, tougher lease terms a lot of the time than, you know, for instance, if you were doing a, um, a lease back when you purchase a practice from the doctor who owns the building that is leasing it back to you, this is different a lot of the time. And so um, it's really important to, to really be, be on the ball. Um, and Liam, I'll kick it to Liam to see if he has anything to add to that. Yeah, no, you, you, you hit the nail on the head, David. Um, too often we see, you know, incomplete LOIs or LOIs that aren't fully hashed out, um, that don't address some of the more material terms. And all it does is create uh, contention during the lease negotiations. Yeah. It creates delays. It, 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 it just, it, it slows the process down. And yeah. as you know, we're David and I are different than most other attorneys. We like to work at a pretty fast pace. We 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 understand time is is money. We want to close transactions. We want to keep things moving. And the last thing we want to do is sit there and waste our time going back and forth over terms that a landlord's never going to agree to, yeah. but we could have addressed on day one um, when we put an LOI together. Um, the, you know, the the other really important thing too to consider is the type of space that's being occupied. Um, is it a first generation space? Is it a second generation or third generation? Getting, if it's a first generation space, there needs to be provisions in that LOI that set forth the construction and build out of that space. Too often we don't see that and now you've lost all leverage and maybe your intent is entirely different than somebody else. Um, or the, your intent for that space is entirely different than what the landlord intended it to be, even though they expected the same use um, and, and generally understanding of what it's going to be used for. It's just the construction on a dental space is, is complex, uh, more, much more complex than a traditional retail space. Um, and so, you know, the landlord's not, it's not just the landlord reviewing and confirming that it's the landlord's lender. Um, and, and so there, there are layers to this that need to get approved. And if you can get out in front of those, it, it makes things, uh, much easier once you get the actual lease document and can put those in there and memorialize those terms. Let me, let me rewind that and unpack it because it's a very, very important key. You guys just jam packed a lot in that. So just kind of rewinding a bit, I'll set the tone and, and I didn't tee it up good enough but an loi guys is, is not binding at all um however it sets the expectations and i think that's what these guys are really talking about is 
if you're setting an expectation that will need to be rewinded or re-looked at once the actual lease gets formed up, you can start getting into some really big issues. And so 100%, like David said, I'm an advisor and absolutely I'm an advisor, but a good advisor knows when to jump in and not to. And yes, I see the same things over and over. However, um, you know, there's just pieces to a lease that I could never touch or things that I might not be able to see because I'm not an attorney. And so I think it's really important to get an attorney involved just to set some of those expectations. But again, uh, there's got to be some pitfalls, though, that you guys might have about going in too heavy or too complex on an LOI, too, because there's something to be said for, um, you know, uh, baking the cake too much before you even uh, get into the lease. I guess I'm, I'm I was trying to be witty, but I got nothing there. But I think you guys get what I'm trying to say here. Is there something to be said for that, though? Like, keep it simple, but also like, help me out here, guys. Yeah, I, I think I think the key to the letter of intent is you want to have you want to outline the most material terms so that everybody is on the same page going in and you're not, as you said, Mike, rewinding. Right. And I think there's definitely a delicate balance there. And as we referenced before, if you go in too heavy, you might build a bad reputation or not reputation, build a bad rapport with the landlord. Um, and they may be less likely to be flexible going into the deal because they're probably there's probably a lot of deal fatigue. Um, you know, the, the landlord has already spent a bunch of more legal fees than they wanted to on their LOI. And they may just be a lot shorter with you on the actual lease if you go in way too heavy on the letter of intent. Um, and so the key is, is to make sure you outline the most material terms. Um, and, and I think that's really kind of what we're getting at here. Um, and I think that's a great point, Mike. What, what, what material so, terms would you guys like to outline? Is that where you're going, Liam? Yeah. I, I see you quick I, I on the draw. Say, I, I, <laughs> yeah, I, I was going to say, I mean, look, there, there, there's, you, you can have situations where, I mean, for, we represent a lot of clients that are not dentists as well. And, and those, in, in those LOIs, they could be seven to eight pages. And that's not, that's not unheard of. Um, it depends on the complexity of the deal. It depends on where it's located. It depends on who you're dealing with on the other side from a landlord's perspective. But generally, the terms that you want to see in the LOI are, are, without a doubt, the length of the term, the amount of the rent, the obligation on a build-out, so the construction, who's performing the work, um, the structure of the lease, whether it's a triple net, it's a double net, or it's mm -hmm. a single net, or it's a gross lease. Um, you, you need to understand that. And if it's a gross lease, that changes things dramatically. But most of these leases we see are going to be net leases, which means that the expenses that the landlord has are passed through to the tenant, which includes not only just operating expenses for the, for the property, but also taxes and insurance. So what we'd like to do is not sit there and negotiate in detail or at ad nauseum all of the nuances of, of those of those provisions, but we certainly like to hash out some of the exclusions that should not be passed through to the landlord or uh, from the landlord to the tenant at that time. Um, one other key piece would be to discuss any cap on those expenses. That's a really important thing. Again, you, you have limited leverage as a tenant oftentimes as, as, as startup dentists. But there are certain things that you can can fight for and should be fighting for, you know, at the onset. And one of those would be ways to try to fix or control some of those pass through expenses. So that would be something in there you would want to do. Any assignment or transfer rights. That's a huge issue that we constantly see dentists, doctors, even even non dental, even non doctor deal with. They want to have an exit strategy or they, 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 they as part of their business model, they want to sell and they want to, they want to leave that space or they want to be able to exit. If you don't agree on that term, that could be a, you know, a deal breaker. So having that explained in the LOI is important. So Liam, I love that you brought up exclusions and you started getting into some definitions of triple net. I want to, I want to, I want to hit some of the, some of these things uh, later on the episode. Yeah. Uh, and I want to make sure that we're super clear. It, it, 
uh, definitions of triple net and the exclusions. Do you have those in the LOI or, or do you hit those later? We, we will we'll put in typically if we get a chance. So if we, if we have the luxury of being able to get and prepare an LOI or, or negotiate an LOI, I certainly will work at least a list of some exclusions. Um, and again, it's, it's not meant to try to over lawyer it. It's meant to just eliminate that as part of the lease negotiation. Perfect. And Let's generally, there, there, there are standard ones that most landlords will accept. And yeah. so it's good to just get those out in front because if the landlord is saying to you at an LOI stage, no, we're not going to accept those, then it's probably exactly. something you got to look, you, you may want to look a different direction because yeah. that, that could be a pretty, pretty significant field. You know, I, li I like that you were, are, are really including kind of like the deal killers on the front end because, because truly exactly. let's, let's be honest. I mean, <clears throat> excuse me, David said earlier on that you want to save time and money because anytime an attorney's involved, you, you don't want to just sit there and just beat the crap out of each other and rack right. up a huge bill. So, so if the LOI does outline some of the key things that Liam and David outline, then that could potentially save you some money by exiting stage left quicker. Right. And so um, I, I love that. I love setting the expectations, but then I guess it's an art, right? It's a dance of not getting too crazy, but at the same time, making sure that they're the deal killers are in there quickly so that you could exit stage left quick. Right. And, and I love that. So that's, those are awesome, awesome things on, on, on the LOI guys, any, any last bit on that? I don't expect you to do, but any last bit on LOIs before we move on to some of the complexity of the actual lease now. Okay, cool. Oh, I think we're good to go. Yeah, that's perfect. I, I love it. So, uh, you may have already touched on this, but let's just build build on this now. So once you so so now the real estate guy or gal is passing this executed LOI and the due diligence is happening. That's really where next level and uh, architects and different people are involved, construction people. So now due diligence is happening. Meanwhile, you guys are coming in and you're going to start. I hate to say it, put your boxing gloves on and the match begins. Right. And so what are some like key or, or maybe three to five things that you find tend to be, you know, pitfalls or issues that maybe a non-dental attorney or someone that doesn't have a lot of experience doing these dental leases, like what are some of the things that you guys are looking out for, like quickly with all of your knowledge, just in the lease part of it? I guess maybe the deal killers is kind of where I'm going for going for. Yeah, but just one point. I just wanted to make one point on the due diligence side. That's that's as as important as not. Uh, you know, from from with the LOI and and all that pre lease um, execution and negotiation. That's as equally important as the LOI. And we provide our clients with a due diligence checklist that they can go through and provide and look at to make sure their things are are correct within that space. It's not an absolute set of, 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 of items, but it's certainly more material things that, that I think all people that, whether you're a dentist or you're a retail center or you're an office space, you should be looking at and evaluating and getting prepared to understand it. Look, you're going to be in there for five to 10 to 15 years. You, you need to understand the space and you need to understand how that, how, how you're going to operate within that building. So I think that's as, as, as important, if not more important than the LOI. You want, let's hit some of those things. Let's hit some of the due diligence checklist stuff. If you guys have it readily available, why, why not? My, my brain's going towards have a contractor walk the space, exactly. uh, have a, our, a space planner, get in there and do a floor plan. Exactly. Um, yep. Is that, is that kind of, yeah. So. Yeah. Those, those things. And it, again, it depends on the generation, the space. So is there a first generation space? Is there a second generation space? If it's a second generation space, are you, is is there an assumption that you're going to be using or or, or or assuming like an existing HVAC system? It would be great to get somebody in there to look at that because chances are you're going to be obligated to maintain, repair, and replace that. Um, to look at the actual the structural elements of that space um, to understand if you're going to be able to 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 install. You know, one of the the, the things that we we get questions on is medical med gas. You know, can we install that in here? Um, that's, that's often considered a hazardous substance. Um, mm -hmm. are you going to be able to do that? Can you run the lines for that in the space? Mm -hmm. Um, is the landlord going, is the landlord thinking about that, um, when they're doing this, they may not have the ability to even do that. 
Um, so those types of things, just really understanding from a construction um, and, and operational standpoint, are you going to are you going to be able to carry out your business operations in there? Again, it's not that if if you know you find out three weeks later, it, you know during lease negotiations, it's a bad thing. No, obviously you could back out if you don't sign the lease. But the point is, we're trying to eliminate that waste of yeah. time um, into doing doing it on the on the onset instead of you know a week before you sign the lease. Yeah, yeah, I I or, love or, or you know God forbid later. I, I love those tips. I, I try to get ahead of that even during the LOI when I'm involved. But but it, if if you're behind the ball and or well, maybe you're listening to this and you're in the middle of it right now, I I couldn't I couldn't agree with you more, Liam. That the more professionals, the more team that you have around you to look out for you and, and your business and your, you know, the situation that you're, you're getting ready to sign a, a, a quite frankly, a million dollar uh, liability on your name. Think about that folks. It's a, it's a million dollar liability over maybe 20 years of 10 years, but w- whatever, 15 years. And it's an obligation. And, and maybe we could get to that in the back end of this episode as well. <laughs> Can you get out of the lease? And what's that look like? These, these guys are going to tell you it's probably pretty difficult and what that looks like. <laughs> but, but, but due diligence should start. I, I like to kind of get started with due diligence when I feel like I'm at like the last uh, 10 yards or maybe the red zone of the LOI. So we know we're pretty, we're probably going to get this where there's a couple little things that we're bickering about on the LOI, but it's going to happen. It's we're, we're, you know, there, we're not going to die on the hill over something. And then that way, a lot of that's out of the way. And then the attorneys can really get going, but, but yeah, it's expensive to walk away from a deal. It happens, it happens quite often, unfortunately. So, um, anything else on due diligence? That's fantastic, Liam. Thank you for making us do that. Yeah, absolutely. No, I mean, we could, we could discuss it. We, again, if anybody has any questions, feel free to reach out. We can provide, you know, more details about that. There's it's, it's really site specific, but we do have some general ones that we can go through. So if anybody has any additional questions or concerns about that, feel free to reach out. Love it. Uh, love that. And, um, uh, I'll actually have below in the, in the descriptions here, uh, for those of you watching, there'll, there'll be just some d- descriptions and how to get a hold of these guys, and also in uh, the 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 recording of whatever uh, you guys are using, whatever platform, Spotify, YouTube, iTunes, and the whole thing. So, uh, I'd love to get give something to these guys. Maybe you guys have a uh, a due diligence checklist or something that you could give them just to just to just to give as a big give here of being on the program. Um, okay. So now let's go to the lease and and thank you, Liam, again for the due diligence stuff. So now that you had a minute, David, I'm going to put you on the spot because you haven't you've been quiet. So what are some of those key things in your mind that you've seen in all the years that you've done this that uh, might be deal breakers during the lease process and how to get through those big, big things quickly and then maybe work on some of the ancillary stuff? What are the big things, the walkaways, the no, this doesn't make sense. Let's move on. Yeah, there there have been a couple um, in particular that have popped up more recently that I would say are are can be complete deal breakers. Um, one of which is a relocation clause. We've had, um, you know, we've seen that a bunch, particularly with those that like didn't get their lease reviewed to begin with, and they're coming to us asking like if this is something that's allowed to be done. And what a relocation clause. <laughs> is to, to the audience is um and, and the listeners is a, a clause that essentially says the landlord can relocate you and for a dentist that's a massive burden particularly because the space is built out for you as a dentist and also you don't know um it, there are expenses um in connection with being relocated and <laughs> It's really <laughs> and it's a really and it's a really important issue to negotiate who's paying for those expenses if you're amenable to being relocated to begin with um and that's you know challenge number one is if so who's paying for it and what we're seeing often particularly in hot markets is that the landlord is not willing to pay for it or they're willing to pay for it to some extent but it's not nearly enough i mean i 
just recently saw a scenario where the client, the landlord gave a client like 25 grand as a registration <laughs> clause. Nice. Um, and their new build out's like 400 grand or something like that. So <laughs> that, off, that that doesn't work. And so that that can be a, a big deal breaker. Um, and that and number two, um, sadly, we are often seeing clients come to us um, again that didn't get their lease reviewed to begin with. Um, that are that are telling they're seeing they're saying that the landlord is saying they get to profit from the sale of that client's dental practice business and. <laughs> What? Yeah, and 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 this is not a one-off. Like we we've seen this several times, um, and um, that is a major major issue. And I think I think where we and Liam, you correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, we're seeing this a little more often in like the shopping centers. Um, and you know, I think those types of clauses are really built more for a retail type of lease. But wow. um, but our clients often are getting stuck with them that you know we're having to take on and see what their rights are. And um, it's really important. And, the, and the, the other thing to understand is it doesn't always say in the lease in black and white, landlord gets to, you know, 10% of the sale proceeds of your sale. It is very hidden vague. times, very vague, very hidden. Um, so you, then that, that just, it, then that means it's open for interpretation for some judge to figure it out. And that's, yeah, scary. I mean, that's, so, yeah, it, it's yeah. definitely open for interpretation, <laughs> but the, the problem is like, there has been a precedent sent set for that language being interpreted in the way that the client wouldn't want uh, it to be interpreted. And so, it, yeah. I mean, that is massive. Like um, to all those out there, these are game changing <laughs> clauses and leases. And and I kid you not, I mean, we have we have seen many not get their leases reviewed um, at all. Wow. And, and so and, and we've had clients that we've pointed these things out to and um, believe it or not, have not taken one change, you know, item to the landlord and just said, well, I'm just going to sign it. Thanks. Yeah. You know, and so I, the point is, is. You know, these are two big examples of, of potential deal breakers. Um, and yeah, that would that would be a deal breaker. Yeah, that's not, but yeah. those two are. Yeah. There's no potential about it. My clients, that's a deal breaker. We're moving right. on. <laughs> right. Yeah. It, it's 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 called a profit. It's called a profit sharing interest. And really, you, you're seeing these. You see them come up, and and it's through cycles. And we saw them, or ten years or fifteen years ago during a down cycle where where rates are increasing and it's more attractive to sublease. And the, uh, whole, the, the, the premise behind the clause is really meant to allow the landlord to participate in any additional rent that the tenant would achieve through subleasing uh, to a third party. Well, However, that makes more sense. That doesn't make him right. sound such gre so greedy. However, wow. However, though, there, there are definitely provisions we see that are structured that basically say, and the, and the logic behind this is, look, you are choosing to lease in our space. Um, we are we are allowing you to occupy the space. So if you're going to sell your business, the business was was grown and, and, and developed here within this space. And without us as landlords allowing you to do it, it technically wouldn't have happened mm. or it may not have happened to the extent it did. And so, therefore, we should be entitled to a certain profit as a result of your performance and your your, your so, ultimate sale. So, does that mean that when you have a slow start, they'll they'll chip in? <laughs> so, hey, right. since they're taking it on the on the on the gains, right. I think we got to. I think we got to get a little bit more creative and get right. it on the losses too, guys. Come on. <laughs> Actually, right. you you guys should do that. You should say you should counter on the next one and say if our projections aren't at least a million or 800 in the first year, you guys are chipping in 5% back. <laughs> right. Hey, that's, well, a, just, good, that's it, a good it, deal. It's, that's it, a good deal. It's, yeah. it's hysterical because like when I tell clients, when we educate clients, like especially on the dental side, that so we'll, we'll explain like, you know, this is triple net, this is what you have to pay. And they're surprised by hearing that because most people think it's a similar, like a gross lease, like a residential lease. If you haven't, if you haven't really gone through a commercial lease before. But then I explained, well, it's actually not that bad. If you're a retail tenant, you'd be paying what's called percentage rent, which is typically attributed to retail tenant lease. And it's like eight, it's between eight to 12% of your gross revenue derived from the space. So not only are you paying base rent, paying all additional rent, but you're paying 
percentage rent, and then any potentially any any proceeds on the sales of your business. It's it, it can get crazy. All right, can, can you guys um um can you guys go through some triple net stuff because sure. um I feel like it's such a wide range of kind of like what's common and what's not. And even I get a little confused sometimes and I see this stuff and talk about this stuff almost every day. So can we just have a minute with triple net and, and, and what does it mean? How is it defined? What's fair market? What's not? Can we just break down NNN real quick? Sure. Do you want me to take it, David? Go for it. So just, I think big picture, um, a lease has multiple, there, there's different cost categories. Um, and, and what I mean by that is expenses to the tenant, what the tenant's obligated to pay. And generally speaking, you have base rent. Base rent is the amount of monthly rent that you're paying to occupy and use that space. In addition to base rent, depending upon the structure of the lease, but let's we're talking about triple net right now. So what that means is that in addition to that, Unlike a, an apartment lease, you pay a percentage, or it's dif- it's oftentimes defined as a pro rata share or percentage share of the landlord's operating expenses. That's one N. So when you say N and N, there's three Ns. N is it stands for a a cost category that's being passed through. One is operating expenses, or sometimes you might hear the term uh, uh, capital. Uh, Capital expenses, or uh, I'm not capital. Um, uh, uh, cam costs, cam yeah. costs. Excuse me. Yeah. Um, the other one is insurance, and then the third one is uh, taxes, real estate taxes. And so the the tenant in a traditional triple net lease would pay all three of those, um, in addition to base rent. There are a variety of of different structures of that and how in the, in the type of, you might hear the term absolute triple net. Um, that would mean all three of those plus all of the maintenance repair and replacement costs. So when you think of like an absolute triple net, that'd be like a CVS or a Walgreens single tenant corner parcel. They are obligated to maintain everything. It's a mailbox check for the landlord. It's all hands off. They're obligated to, to do everything. Um, in a traditional office or retail shopping center lease, triple net, it's not that it's not that comprehensive. The, the tenant has its repair and op- replacement obligations. The landlord has their replacement obligate repair and replacement obligations. Then it becomes a question of can you pass can the landlord pass through those repair and replacement obligations? Oftentimes they're in this is where lawyers step in. We'll try to exclude some of those pass through costs. Mm-hmm. And the reason they're excluding them are because as a tenant, you should not be paying to improve the, the landlord's property. You're paying to maintain your, and, 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 and to an extent repair it for your usage of it, but right. you're not meant, you're really not, the goal is not to enhance or make the landlord in a better better position by by essentially occupying and using the space. Well said, yeah. Mm-hmm. That's perfect. So that, yeah. That's the, just the general concept of the I place. love it. You did a great job. Anything to add to that, David? That's fantastic. It's perfect. No, I think that was great. Yeah, that that was fa- fantastic. So so essentially, uh, help help me, guys. So basically, the operating costs, the insurance, and then the taxes, and those are the three essentially the three ends. Correct. Yes. And where's the ends when, come when from? When you say insurance, when you say insurance, it, it, I just want to clarify. It's usually the the the, the landlord's property and commercial general liability insurance liability. that they have for, for yeah for for the whole entire space. And what, what's up with the N? Why is it ends? What is that? Someone Actually, just made know. that up a long time yeah, ago. Yeah, it's just, it's just good, like <laughs> net. Well, it stands for net to the landlord. So it's net, like your net, net, be, net, yes, net. That's exactly. Yeah, yeah. So it. like it, because in a double net lease, um, one of those ends is not passed through. So double landlord net. would carry taxes or landlord would carry insurance. Okay. Uh, and so it would, the same thing would apply for a single net. So digging in a little bit deeper on on one of those ends, I, I feel like insurance is pretty standard and taxes that that's pretty standard. The operating expenses, which you, Liam, you were getting into a little bit, that one's not so standard. And I and I do have a even I have a trouble 
looking at that and saying, well, what are the guardrails here? Is this the landlord's brother that's overcharging the building for clearing the snow every week? And or or maybe the landlord owns this other company that also does roofing and he just slammed us with a crazy roof bill. Like there's some shady stuff out there. So like the operating expenses in my mind has a lot of loose holes in it. Can you guys any feedback or uh, anything there? Like, are there guard? I think you said caps. You can do caps and stuff like, or do you define what that one? Yeah. Ended? So yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So just to, just to, there's a variety of ways you can do this. And, and the, the, the first, the first approach to this, and we look at it more hierarchically, like how you can attack it. Um, and it, you have to appreciate it. You're not going to always get this. So it, it really depends on your leverage. If you're a major shopping center and or if you're, if you're a leasing space in a major shopping center and you're the anchor tenant, you're going to have much more leverage than you would be if you're a 1200 square foot, you know, retail or, 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 you know, dental office space. So you have to take all of this kind of with a grain of salt. All, all landlords are different. Some have different yep. um, approaches to this. But yeah. generally, the best the best option would be to try to advocate for a cap, some cap or some some limit on how much these expenses can be passed through. Uh, one little tip on this, like if I'm if I'm represent, we represent a lot of landlords and non dental landlords, just you know, shopping center or retail tenant. I define operating expenses as operating expenses. I don't define them as CAM if I'm representing a landlord. And the reason is because you get can get more in there if they're defined as operating expenses. CAM mm -hmm. is a component of operating expenses. Yeah. People don't often think that or realize that, but it's true. And so it, it's it's how it's termed. First of all, you have to understand how it's termed in the lease and defined. But then one way to kind of capture all of it is to say any item, regardless of how it's defined, whether it's CAM or operating expenses, whatever, one way to kind of control this as a whole is to cap that cost category. So what I mean by that is saying that year over year, those expenses that the landlord incurs and tries to then roll through to you or pass through to you cannot increase by more than a certain percentage each year. And that percentage is typically based on whatever inflation is, but it's usually fixed in the lease. And so we, a year and a half ago, we were fighting for five caps and six caps. Now it's eight and a half to nine percent caps. Um, you know, the lower the better, obviously, for the tenant. But you have to be realistic. And, and if the cost of construction is increasing every year, and the cost of certain things are, you know, it, it, um, just general operating expenses for that landlord are increasing each year, um, they're not going to agree to a four percent cap. It's yeah. just not going to happen. So you have to be realistic when you approach that, but that's one way to try to fix all of this. I and love there that. There are you yeah. know counters to this that, that are happy mediums, and we can get into that if you would like in more detail. But um, that's that's one way. There's others, and I'll get into those. But I'll let I'll turn it back over to you. Um, yeah, that's that's fantastic. I that was well well said, and um, hopefully that helps the audience. I guys, I. I'm glad Liam said this because um, it kind of goes without saying, um, but we got to say it. <laughs> and that is everybody's situation is unique, is different. Someone in New York versus someone in Kansas versus someone in Seattle and SoCal. Dude, there's, there's so many variables to all of this. You know, California has got its own set of rules. I mean, that's a, that's a crazy market, right? Uh, you're in the middle of Ohio. It's probably not going to be that bad, you know, and so <clears throat> so uh, corporate owned versus privately owned. Uh, maybe the dentist owns it and is is leasing back to you. I mean, that's why you guys need solid folks like these guys uh, to really comb through everything and decide, you know, if if things are good or, or not. And uh, again, uh, I'm an advisor. I'm not on that level. These guys are ninjas when it comes to leases. So, and we let them be that we let them be ninjas. Uh, Mike, there's one other quick expense that I just wanted to talk about. That's sort of, that's a bigger picture expense. Sweet. That I think it's important to focus on too. For yeah. The doctors and that's, um, you know, upon termination of the lease, 
whose financial responsibility is it to return the premises back to its original condition? And that can be a very big expense for the doctor. And so sometimes you'll see in leases, um, you know, something sometimes references like white box condition, but um, it, it talks about who's responsible for returning the premises back to its original condition. And when you talk about a dental office that's been built out specifically for dentistry, um, that cost can be significant. So that's yeah. another thing, um, sort of like a big picture thing to, to make sure you're looking out for. Yikes. Yeah, guys, like one of these sentences co could cost you literally a hundred thousand, two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars. It's it's wild. It's absolutely wild. Attorney fees. I'm sorry, nobody loves paying attorney fees, guys. <laughs> but like, the best way you could say it is like it literally is the cheapest insurance of your entire deal of having attorneys look at stuff. I mean, I've got it. Everybody's got an attorney, or if you don't, you need to get one. Um, uh, so thank you for, th for that, David. Um, any last bit on the, the NNN? It looks like Liam's chomping at the bit on something else. No, I, I just, I just want to say one other thing. I mean, so if, if you don't, if you can't get a cab, one of the next best options would be to, to actually go through. I mean, we would, we do it for both. Even if we have a cap, we still try to exclude out. Uh, it's, it's a, it's a pretty comprehensive list, but it's just, it's, it's items that are not, that should not be passed through to the landlord uh, or by the landlord to the tenant. And the reason they're not being passed through because they're just, the, 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 they would be viewed as in giving the landlord a, a, a greater benefit for the bargain for what, what they're getting. Um, and, and, and they're either putting the landlord in a better position. Um, they're improving the, the asset or, or, you know, they're, they're, they're not meant to, to be that um, they're just not costs that are affiliated with maintaining and, and, and operating the space, their ownership costs. That's the best way to understand it. I love it. Um, I love, I love that. Yeah. So, and, and so that, that's, that's additional protection. And the last thing I would just want to say is an audit, right? Really important thing. We don't see tenants exercising too much. It's mainly just meant to be a check against the landlord. But the fact of the matter is that you're when you get this expense statement from a landlord, you're, you're, you're really relying on them that that's that, that, that expense for your operating expenses is true and correct. And so you should have the right to be able to look at those books and records. And to, if, if you feel that, you, you know, those expenses are inaccurate and um, it's, it's, it's market to have that in a lease. And we, we always will include that. In our, what ha in our what happens when you do an audit and you find brother is shoveling snow for 20,000 a year? Yeah. <laughs> well, there has to be there. Ha there would have to be a reconciliation of that, and and that's part of that. So without that, you don't have the right to to seek that reconciliation. You you really have no right to find find that out, but you would certainly not have a right to to get a reconciliation. So without so, it, you're basically just taking the landlord's word for it. So asking for an audit and having the right for an audit, but then you also warrant you some some privileges that if you find some nonsense that you could retro and and normalize a market expense it sounds like on on those sure. certain things yeah yeah and, and a dso might you know this is kind of in the context of the dental space a dso you know if they're coming in and buying a practice and they don't they feel that the the the, uh, the operating expenses exceed what they should be for that space we have we have actually seen them exercise audits um, they they made the tenant exercise the audit to confirm that they're in fact true and correct. And the DSO. So so, so yeah. let me guess, they bought the practice from the dentist. <laughs> you know, dentist holds the property, so now they're well, associate. It's actually, <laughs> yeah. Well, it's before that. It's before that. So as part of their due diligence, so they they'll want to see because they're oh, inheriting the lease, they're taking over the space, they're looking at these expenses and they're saying, well, these seem to be a little bit higher than. It typically should be. I want to see these, but if you don't have in your lease, that might cost you the deal. You might not yeah. be able to close the deal without it. So right something on. to consider. Well, guys, I um, usually, excuse me, I'm having a cough attack today. Uh, usually I get into like three or, or four, four things. We got so deep into some of these categories. I really appreciate you guys just really drilling in and getting getting deep on some of this stuff and not, and not being too high level. It's all, that's all about the three guys in a coffee shop uh, thing is that you guys uh, didn't hold back and you, and you really gave us a lot to think about. I just thank you so much for 
giving that and 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 um providing us that that information um clearly folks these guys know what they're doing and 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 you know there's probably i don't even know 75 percent more of a lease that that we could get into today but unfortunately the time time is money i guess we got to jump but any last minute any last things that you really wanted to impart on the audience and it's okay if it's there's nothing but like anything else on the least topic that you got to get off uh, your chest. And if not, then I need one story. This is story time. Uh, give me a story guys of all the deals you've been on. Give me a story of like the craziest situation that you've seen on a lease. If, if you have it. So one last thing or story time, go one of you. I'll defer to David on that one. He's got some <laughs> good ones. Well, I, I mean, story time. I mean, I would say that, you know, we had a doctor, in Hawaii that um, the landlord was asking for between one to two million dollars of their sale price. Um, I know we talked about this already, but I mean, it's it's a story. It's a real <laughs> story. And, and frankly, the lease probably granted them that and wow. they weren't backing off it, you know, and they had. So it was definitely um, it, the bottom line is this, you know, if you're if you're going to get a legal document reviewed, you should have a lawyer review your legal document, you know, just yeah. like if you're going to go get a haircut, you know, you're not going to do it yourself. You're going to go get a haircut from someone who does haircuts typically. So, yeah, you know, I true. think ultimately that's, it's really the basics. And we see way too often um, doctors not take the lease or, you know, real estate components um, as seriously as the practice side, which makes sense. I mean, it's understandable. You're a dentist, you're excited about the practice, but don't neglect the lease because as Mike said so brilliantly earlier, this, this is like a million dollar um, commitment that you're making, um, sometimes more, um, depending on the term of the lease. So, um, you know, that's the final thing I'll say. And, and also, too, we really meant it. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. We're also happy to, to share the due diligence checklist, um, you know, per Mike's um, question about that. So um, feel free to, to reach out. That's awesome, guys. That's a, <clears throat> that's a big give. I, I'll add to that, David, that um, your CPA your consultant, your banker, even your real estate broker are not attorneys. Don't, don't send me the lease to review. I'm going to tell you, I can't do that. Sure. I might find something, but I'm not an attorney. Your CPA is not an attorney. Your banker is not an attorney. Uh, get the team that get the right people around you. And, and, and by the way, if, if a consultant ever does say I'll review it, that's, that's not a good consultant. <laughs> I, I, I'm just staying away from that, man. That's not, that's not my scope. So just you, you, again, it takes, it takes a village, as I say. And, um, and uh, uh, hopefully you guys reach out to me or, or the, the, the Cohen property law group as, as uh, maybe someone that could be in your village. So with that uh, being said, guys, I, I really appreciate your time and your knowledge and, uh, um, thank you again for being on the show. Huge gratitude for having us. As I said, you know, we're, we're, I feel like we might be famous now, now that we're on your podcast. <laughs> um, it'd be funny to, fun to, to see it. I, I don't know about that, but I'll, I'll, I'll sign off on that note, guys. Thanks so much. Uh, from, from the, co from the coffee shop. We'll talk to you guys soon. Thanks.